is up front and personal and the best I know to do to tell you. Take your Bible now, if you will, please. I'm going to start off kind of where I left off this evening or this morning. I never got here. Come to 1 John. And what I was explaining to you this morning and we never got around to is, is that we already talked about your judgment of your sins at Calvary and judgment as a son and that you recognize and see that once you become a believer, you're a saved individual, but you're capable of doing anything. And as a result of that, there has to be a constant check on yourself. And so when I talk about the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, when it says to you to judge unless you, you know, be judged with the world or condemned with the world, that's not just for the sake, ladies and gentlemen, of just judging bad things. It's the motive for the good things. It's taking a look at myself and saying, what is my reason for why I'm doing what I'm doing? Uh, why am I coming to church? And why do I read my Bible? And why do I pray? Have you ever considered sometimes looking at the motive behind what you do? I can tell you I know my motive for getting saved was to avoid burning. Uh, that just That's the only way I know to tell you. I wish I could tell you it was some deep theological thing. Bottom line is, I literally was scared to death. It was real to me that I was going to burn forever. And I saw a way out, and it was through Jesus Christ, and I took it. Now, after that, oftentimes we as human beings have a tendency to maybe not always have the purest of motives for the reasons for what we do and why we do it. So judging yourself in light of the judgment seat of Christ, which Lord willing I'll get to tonight, becomes imperative. And if you're doing it for any other reason than the right reason, then it becomes sinful in nature. So all sin, I don't want to give you this impression, is things that you think about on the outside. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, he said, let us cleanse ourselves of both the flesh and the spirit. So there's things on the inside. The problem with sin is it's an inside job. I've given you the illustration before, but back in the day, a billion years ago, I'm about 13, I guess, or so, working out. I made uh, 35 cents or 45 cents uh, to start with an hour. And then I went up to a dollar and a quarter after they figured I was going to stay around. And that was on my pay. That's when gasoline was about a dime a gallon. But people would come in there and your job was to air up their tires and uh, you had to check their oil and check the transmission fluid if it wasn't a straight stick. And you had to always clean their windshield. And oftentimes what a Christian thinks is, is that all the bugs and all the dirt's on the inside. And you get that windshield squeaky clean. And the person says, there's still dirt. I can still see dirt on it. And oftentimes you take that rag and you reach on the inside and you clean the inside and it's kind of like, oh... I didn't know that the dirt was on the inside. As a Christian, you have to be more concerned about the dirt on the inside than what's on the outside. Too much emphasis on nothing but the outward creates a Pharisee. Inwardly is what you want to focus on and let the rest of it take care of itself. So Paul sa or John says this in 1 John chapter number 1, you're familiar with it, talking about judgment of yourself. He says in verse number 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay, that's written to believers. That's not just a tribulation Jew, and that's not in reference to salvation. That has to do with fellowship. Now look at verse number 9. Here's the out. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all... If we say we have not sinned, we make... Him a liar. You know what he just did? He just put you in a box. The verse that we like to use a lot is 1 John 1, 9. On both sides of that verse, you know what he said? <laughs> Don't be calling him a liar and say you haven't sinned. So that's to remind us that we're nothing but saved sinners. Brother Lenny from up in uh, Canada has uh, been down here with us for a long time. His family moved down here. Brother Lenny, you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message. Would you please? Thank you, Lord, for this evening and for having your doors open on your church. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for the online ministry. I pray that the service goes out uh, undefiled. Amen. And I thank you for that ministry, but it's so good, Lord, to be in your house. Amen. I thank you for the man that you have in the pulpit. Amen. Oh, Lord. Amen. Give him all the strength, the unction he needs, Lord, to preach, but he is a man, and I thank you how he allows you to use him, Lord. Keep him submissive. submissive. 
and disciplined, Lord, to give you loud and clear. Yes. Give him the strength and energy that he needs. Yes. Thank you for the brethren. Yes. And I thank you, God Almighty, yes. for having me here. Yes. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Now, in reference to this thing about judging yourself, take your Bible and come to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to show you a few verses. Brother Lance, by the way, your choir sounded great today. I was in meetings, but um, even though when my door closed, they were rattling the rafters in there. And if you're a part of the choir, man, you really sounded good. I was ready to cut my suspenders and let me go on, boy. It was... It's a blessing to know that the people that are up here singing, that you're singing like that, and uh, you took the time out of your day to be here, and I, I appreciate that very much. That was excellent. All right, now let's look at this thing about judgment of yourself. Now, do you understand? We clearly went over. This has nothing to do with your salvation. You're already saved. You're sealed to the day of redemption. You're that jar of pickles, or you're that those beans that are in the, in the jar, and the jar might get dirty, but the beans don't get messed up. You understand that, right? But we're talking about a judgment of ourself. Now, I don't know about you. I can speak for me and I can speak freely about me because I know me better than you know me. I know me better than she knows me. I don't know me better than he knows me. But I find oftentimes in my life when I let things slip, when I let things go along, I begin to see certain things in my life that are indicative of a problem between me and him. They just begin to show up. They're telltale signs. Something's not right. I mean, I read my Bible, but it becomes somewhat burdensome. And I, my prayer life, it doesn't quite seem to be hitting. You know, it doesn't quite seem to be uh, connecting there. And uh, everybody may be getting a blessing out of a service or out of a message, and I'm kind of ho-hum, and, you know, I'm kind of the, whatever the guy's name is at Christmas time that don't like Christmas, the old fella in the window that gets a turkey at the end of the thing. You know, God bless this tiny, t what's that? Let's get that guy, Scrooge. I, I'm, I'm kind of when, it, when I when I get that way when I get cynical, yeah. I, I there's something wrong, and and it's between me and him. And now what I like to do is make it between me and her. I mean, she's the closest one. She's the easy target. Why not? I know you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't ever blame your spouse. I mean, sometimes if you got up in the morning and hurt her, she'd think I'm the problem. You know, too. I mean, that that goes on in life. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Y'all are like, oh, I can't believe you just... Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes you think it's your kids. Sometimes you're thinking, what were we thinking when we had these children? <laughs> they're such a blessing. Right now, they're not a blessing. Right? Sometimes children can be somewhat burdensome. Oh, you're excluded in that. You're okay. But I'm just saying. You, not so much yet. I'm just... <laughs> but, but now think about this. When it, com when it comes to that... I recognize that there's something wrong, but my tendency is even greater than that. And this is the point I want to, to, to bring to your attention about judging yourself. It's the fact that I have ignored that God is aware of everything that I'm doing and have done. And I have chosen to ignore His knowledge of my foolishness. Therefore, I am slow to... Admit to what he already knows. The hardest agreement I ever have is this. To agree with God against myself. I always want to have that argument. You ever had that? Where the Lord comes and says, like we talked about this morning, Thou art the man, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I might be, but... I'm not a Saul. I might be, but I'm not a Judas. I mean, you might be right, but you couldn't call me Jonah, right? I, I, I might, that might be me, but I'm not Cain. That's my natural tendency. Now, again, if it's not yours, you can take a nap. We'll wake you up when we're done. I'm trying to get out of the way here tonight and let you go home and rest. But I want you to understand that I'm going to show you a couple of things. And the intent of that is, is that judgment of yourself is to your benefit. So you don't put the Lord in a position that he has to chasten you. You can avoid a chastening. If you just go ahead and say, Lord, I'm wrong, have mercy on me. And you know what else you can do? If he chooses to chasten you, you can lessen the severity of that chastening if you'll go ahead and come off of it and say, I'm the problem. 
Now, it's just something for you to consider because we're fixing to hit the judgment seat of Christ if we can get past these. I'm just going to give you a half a dozen verses for you to look up. Look in Hebrews chapter 4, look in verse number 13. This is right after the Word of God comes in, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, pierced the divided center, soul and spirit, joints and marrow, so on and so forth, right? Rightly dividing the Word. Look at verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. That's a good reminder for me. Right after one of my favorite, uh, most quoted verses in the Bible about the Word of God, it's right in there saying, to me, this is what it says to me, I gave you the Bible and part of the purpose of giving you the Bible is, is so that you realize I can see what you're doing right through this book. So I realize why a lot of people don't read the book and it's for verse 13's sake. It's not because they don't rightly divide the Bible. It's because when they read it, all of a sudden their sin is magnified and they'd rather it not be. And the Lord says, I, I got gotcha. you. The old preacher used to say this all the time. Take your Bible, pardon me, come to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. The old preacher used to say this. He said, the Bible is one of the strangest books in all the world, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Who doesn't know that? But he'd say this, it is the only book in the world that reads you, you don't read it. He used to say that in the Bible that one of the things that determines what you get out of the Bible is the attitude that you have when you approach the Bible. That means that book is supernatural in nature. That means that when a preacher, whoever that preacher is, is preaching out of that Bible, he's speaking as it were the oracles of God. And what you have to be careful to do is to make sure you're speaking as if it was God speaking and you can't kind of put your little sort of spin on it and don't we, let me rephrase, don't I at times read what the verse says and it speaks very clearly to where I'm wrong and I kind of put my little spin on it. And I, and I kind of lessen the severity of the fact that God knows the truth of the whole thing, whether I can justify it or not. Why don't I just come clean, get it over with, get it past us and get to moving on? I, I couldn't tell you why you don't. I know why I don't. It's because I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I don't want to quit it. Because I care more about me than I care about... See, it boils down to that almost every time. Look at this passage in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Uh, jump all the way down in the interest of time. Come to verse number 013. Now this is written by the preacher. This is written by Solomon. This is written by the man that's considered to be the wisest man in all the earth. Uh, so other than Jesus Christ around, he's wiser than Daniel and wiser than all the other ones that are around, right? Watch what he says. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. After he's speculated, pondered, thought about, mused, and considered all these things, he comes down to this conclusion. Smartest man in all the earth, right? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. <laughs> well, it's pretty simplistic. Yeah, some of those commandments are hard to keep, aren't they? Amen. I don't know about you. I'm glad I'm not under the Old Testament. Amen. I'm glad they hadn't handwriting of ordinances were nailed to the, to the cross. I'm glad I got a little bit of liberty, a little bit of breathing room. I can't keep the Ten Commandments, let alone the other 600. That's just me. But now watch verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, I know where that goes. I understand it fits for the great white throne judgment. We'll talk about that later at some point in time. But I want you to pause and think for just a minute. When it comes to judging things, if he knows everything, even if he doesn't bring it to your attention publicly, what's the point of us lying to him? Part of judging yourself, ladies and gentlemen, is recognizing God's right, you're wrong, that's settled. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. It matters that he already knows the question before he asks. You ever, have you ever been in the box or have you ever been interviewed before? Let me just give you a clue. Oftentimes when a really good detective is interviewing you, he's asking you questions he already knows the answer to. Do you know why he's doing that? Do you know what is just as detrimental to the defendant in court as a confession is, the lies he tells to cover up the truth. 
The lies can be used against him if you know what the truth is and he lies, I wasn't there, I never was driving that car, I wasn't dressed that way, that's not me in that picture, I don't care what this person said. Could you write all that down? They write down the whole thing. You know what you submit as evidence? You submit the lies. And not recognizing or realizing that all that guy's doing is asking you everything and you're removing yourself from the situation, put yourself right smack dab in the middle of it. When God asks you a question, ladies and gentlemen, trust me when I tell you, He already knows the answer. So, so why would you try to justify it and make a reason for it or what we used to call in the day alibi it? We're all guilty of that. Look, it's not big me, little you. Can we just get on the same page for a second? Let's park our egos for just a moment here and recognize that a really good investigator is probably asking you, I don't care what it does on TV, I don't watch enough of that to make a difference, but I'm telling you, they're probably asking you questions that they already know the answer to to see whether or not when you do finally come off the truth, if there is any reason for them to believe what you're saying. And if you lied to them in two or three cases and then you're like, oh, I swear on my mother's eyes. We all used to roll our eyes and go, okay, here comes the lie. Here's a great way to know. You walk into the, uh, the interview room, when you walk into that room and you got the bad guy in there and this is him. And you say, hey man, hey man. Huh? He's acting like he was asleep, like, oh, I'm not bothered by all that. Hey, what, what's the matter? <laughs> I know what the matter is. You're trying to act like you don't feel guilty. You're guilty. Yeah. Your actions show that. Now, look, let me not make this between you and someone else, okay? Don't start trying to read people's body language and trying to figure out what they're doing. I need you to listen to me. I'm talking about you and the Lord. If He knows everything, He ain't Santa Claus. He's God. Amen. He sees you when you're sleeping. That's right. Amen. And He knows when you're awake. Amen. And He knows if you've been bad or good. Right? Okay, so let me show you a couple more here. Does it make sense to you? Look, if you will, in the book of Proverbs. Now, I'm trying to help you avoid a whipping. You, you, you know what? The great thing is, is that when the Lord catches you, David still had to have four sheep for a sheep. Is that right? Can you imagine if he'd have played like Saul? Are you cold? If you're cold, I'll turn the air conditioner down. I can. All I have to do is say something like, turn the air conditioner down. You'll, you'll be surprised. It'll go poof. I have that kind of... I just have somebody that runs the thermostat. But, but can, I, can I tell this to you? Can you imagine, have you ever thought about, have you thought about the antithesis, the opposite, if David had responded the way Saul responded? Have you ever paused to think how the story would have turned out differently about David? Do you think it would have still just been four sheep for a sheep? Let me ask you this. When 70,000 died because David numbered the, the troops over there, do you think it would have turned out different if David had, had not said, Lord, be merciful to me, let me fall into the hands of the living God. Do you know when to quit and I don't? And Do you, do you think the story would have been different? He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I mean, I, we're good to go. These people are whacked out and crazy, man. I don't care if they die. You think the story would have been different? I believe it would have been different. What do you see in those cases? You see an individual who's willing when the Lord says, Thou art the man to say, You're right. No excuse. No blaming somebody else. No blaming my environment. I got dropped on my head when I was a kid. The way I was raised. None of that. Just, you got me. You know what he does? He avoids the chastisement that's coming and it being worse than it has to be because God got his attention when he got pulled over. No, I stopped you? Yes, sir. Busted a red light. Here's your ticket. Well, sir, where do I pay it? You don't. It's a warning. Why are you giving me a warning? Because you knew why I stopped you. What's the point of grinding it? Same guy runs a red light and kills somebody. Sir, I was wrong. It's my fault. I T-boned him. I ran the red light. Okay. Well, there's going to be a price to pay with that. You're going to have to live with somebody that may have vehicular manslaughter, and you may have to still get a ticket for that and be officially charged and insurance rates and all that kind of stuff. It's a different set of circumstances because now there's collateral damage that requires a more severe punishment. Amen. 
Making sense to you so far? Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes the reason we get sideways with the Lord is because of the collateral damage that gets created because of our unwillingness to have accepted the warnings that transpired before. Amen. And when we don't, there's all of a sudden collateral damage and it can affect our families and our friends and our church and our business and our health and our mental health, our emotional health. It can affect us across the board. Yeah. We can turn into lunatics. Look in Proverbs chapter number 15. Proverbs chapter number 15. I must not have given that to you. Here are the pages turning. Look, if you will, please, in verse number oh, 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. We're talking about the Lord being able to see everything, right? The passage in Psalm where David says, Though I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Would you agree that all things are naked and open before the Lord? Yes. All right, look at verse number 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more then the hearts of the children of men? If hell and destruction are before the Lord and He sees that, He cares more about where your heart is than He does about two things that are pretty significant in eternity. Right? How much more then of our hearts of men? So the Lord knows what's in our heart. It does matter to Him. And He gives us certain things that we can check up on on a regular basis. Come to uh, 2 Chronicles. i got to find that one. 2 Chronicles, I believe it will be 16. 2 Chronicles 16. Now, now here's the thing. We could prevent a lot of the stuff that goes along with our sin if we would learn not to be repeat offenders. Sorry... I, I, I'm sorry for making the continual reference to, to what I used to do previously, but they have repeat offender acts. They have three strikes and you're out acts. They have certain enhancements to the penalty phase of certain trials for individuals who committed the crime, but they've done things that enhance the crime, and therefore there is a minimum standard that the judicial system cannot go below that standard, they have to receive that amount, or they used to. I don't know, I'm, I, I'm guessing it's still the same way, unless they've repealed the law. Here's the thing, if you're a repeat offender, then what they know is, is that you've been in, you got punished, you didn't learn, you got in, you got punished, you didn't learn, you got in, you got punished, you didn't learn. So each time what happens is, is that statute winds up going up and the repercussions of your actions, because you're a repeat offender, are greater for the same crime that you committed here. It's the same one, but you keep committing it. You keep doing it, and so they're saying, well, you can't seem to learn your lesson, and so the severity of the penalty continues to rise. Does that make sense to you? Can I say this spiritually? I believe the Lord works the same way. Don't know about you. I believe I can show you biblically where at times the Lord has been merciful to me and He lets me off with a warning. But if I commit the same act again, I might get a swat. I might get a, okay, a little tighten up kind of a deal. Might get a little solitary confinement. They're, 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 and here's the thing about me, maybe not you. I apologize for keep saying that because I can't speak for you. When the Lord's getting on my dingbat, I know who it is. Amen. He, it does not like, you know, oh, well, you know, this has happened and that's happened, this person, that. I know when it's the Lord getting on to me. Amen. And I know what it's for. Right. I mean, I can bang my head and go, yes, sir. You say, oh, you mean you think that? Well, that's the first thought a lot of times for me. It's like, yeah, I know why. Well, you got something you hadn't done. Now, let me just suggest this to you. Why do we continue to repeat that? Do we not kind of trot underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ and take it for granted that He's going to forgive us? And if that's not the case, why don't you stop doing what you keep getting in trouble for? Amen. The last time you got out of fellowship with the Lord, how was your joy? I'm just asking. 
I'd be willing to bet you that it wasn't there and I'd be willing to bet you that the way the devil was able to put a yoke of iron on your net is because all of a sudden now you're coming to church, reading your Bible, praying, serving, doing whatever you're doing, but you're no longer doing it with the joy in your heart. Now all of a sudden because you serve not the Lord with the gladness of heart and the joy that you're supposed to have, the Lord allows the devil to put a yoke of iron on your neck and it becomes burdensome and everybody becomes your enemy. But boy, remember the day when you couldn't believe the Lord would let you do anything? David even says as a king, you know what he said? Man, I'd love to just be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Well, David, you're the king, man. I mean, you're the prince in eternity. I mean, out in the millennial kingdom. you got to be kidding me. I mean, God likes you. You're the giant slayer. Boy, you're the Philistine killer. You're the greatest king in all of Israel. God likes you. That's an understatement. Yeah, you know what? I, sh- I-, I can't believe he'd even let me keep the doors at his temple. That's a mouthful. He deserves to be up there on the big platform with the big dogs, right? right? Not David. He's like, man, you remember the day when it was that way? Where you couldn't believe the Lord would let you get up and sing a song? You couldn't believe the Lord would let you give a word of testimony? You couldn't believe the Lord let you come, let the Lord let you get baptized, let the Lord join the church? Do you remember that? What, what happened to that? I bet the last time that you stepped out and stepped away from the Lord, I'd be willing to bet you life had become sort of routine and mundane, hadn't it? And I bet you coming out of your mouth weren't the Psalms and the praises of the Lord. I bet other things were coming out of your mouth. You say, what was it? It's like a rotten tooth. Before long, no matter how many times you brush your teeth and gargle with with, uh, whatever you call that mouthwash, uh, you still stinks. You say, why? You got something rotten. You with me? Why do we keep doing it? I mean, I mean, it's good job security, I guess. <laughs> you keep doing the things you're doing is good to keep the preacher in, in business, I guess. But shouldn't we stop? Why don't we? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Why are some of you still bitter? Why are some of you still holding animosity towards somebody that's 10, 15, 20 years old? Some of them are in the ground. Like that old cuss I told you about in Carolina. Well, if you'd have known what they'd done to my mama. Well, how long has your mama been dead? 25 years. You're not going to go to church because of what they did 25 years ago? You say, what is that? Why, would you, why would you do that? Do you think God's up there going, I just don't understand that. Do you realize what you're doing to my reputation? God's not going to go against you. You can pray till the cows come home. He ain't going to move against His free will. Amen. You know what He will do though? He'll help you with yours. Yes. Yeah. You know what would be great? What would be great, ladies and gentlemen? You can keep fanning the fans. I'll get the hint in just a minute. Stir the air up. I'm with you. I'm going through manopause, not menopause. I'm, I'm listening to you. But now, but now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to grab this. It's important. I wish some of you would pray as hard for God to change your will as you pray for God to change the will of someone else. Amen. You pray, God fix them. God do something to them. Don't kill them, but make them hurt. You know? And and the Lord's like, why don't you pray that on yourself? Because He'll allow you, He'll affect you if you ask Him to help you because you ask Him to do it, He'll do it. Not, Lord, make me willing to be willing. He ain't going to do that. But Lord, I know I'm wrong and I need help. Oh, He'll help you with that. Lord, I know Brother Larry's wrong. Change him. Lord's like, why don't you pray that on yourself? Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't listen to other people that are praying for you? Really, aren't you glad the Lord doesn't? Are you re- you really want to put your spiritual life in the hands of somebody else? Boy, that's a lot of trust. When you tell somebody pray for you, it's kind of like, I don't know. I bet you you don't ask your enemies to pray for you. I have some people in here that pray for me. I get jammed up sometimes and I call them up or I'll shoot them a a text thing and say, hey, pray for me. I don't give them all the details. They know if they get something like that, that, you know, the ox is in the ditch and they need to pray. 
And some of you see it and you're like, man, we better pray for the preacher. I don't know what's going on. Sometimes I can't tell you. But you know what? I don't pray my enemies that. My enemies that have me in the ground. I told uh, the boys here the other night, talking about a couple of things going on. I said, I honest to the Lord, I do not know how in the world that old preacher was able to do it. As you get older in life, how he had so many enemies and he continued to go the way he went. I don't know how he did it. That had to be one of the most difficult things I could even imagine. The many people that were praying against him and turning out hate mail and turning out... I don't know how he did that. It's supernatural, I guess. But I'm going to ask you a question. Do you pray as hard about God changing you as you do God changing others? I'm going to ask you a second part of that question. Can you not be happy until somebody else has got it in the neck? Your enemy? Why, isn't that Christ-like? I'm talking about judging yourself. I'm saying in Matthew 7, He said, Judge not lest ye be judged. For in whatsoever manner ye judge, ye shall also be judged. Second Corinthians said, Know ye not, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Well, you better be careful how you're judging. You ought to be able to say to your enemy, pray for me, and know with a clear conscience you've been praying for them the right way, so you expect them to pray for you the right way. Is that how you pray for your enemy? I'm talking about real Christianity. God kill them. I don't have a verse in my Bible, or I mean a, a, a name in my Bible, where I pray that on anybody. You say, why? God's got them in my life for a reason. I've learned that. Sometimes it's a knock the stinking tar out of me. But, but let me ask you now, I want you to think about it before I show you this next verse here. I've got just a couple more to show you before we move on. But I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you pray so hard for other people to get fixed and you don't work as hard on your own personal life. Why is that? You don't think the church would be better if at that point we just prayed for ourselves when it comes to that matter? Good night, preacher. That's serious as a sack full of rattlesnakes. Yeah, it is. That's the answer at the judgment seat of Christ stuff. You know what the Bible says in John 17 about the Lord? That Bible says that the Lord's up there praying for the ones that God gave Him. How you want Him praying for you? What do you think He's praying? I'm just asking. We're talking about judging yourself. You can judge yourself and judge what you think of God. And number one, He's watching you. Number two, He's listening to how you're praying. Your happiness always hinges on somebody else. And whether or not they're with you or not, you don't have enough friends in the world to stick with the ones that do. You always got to... I, I, if I could get some of you to understand, you spend so much time focusing on your enemies, the reason you don't have friends is because they're afraid you'll talk about them the way you're talking about your enemies. That includes ex-wives and ex-husbands. You're welcome. That includes old boyfriends and old girlfriends and former preachers and deacons and trustees and song leaders and camp counselors and the list is endless and old bosses. and Well, at what point do you pray for the, for the good ones? I mean, if you spend more time praying for them, you probably run out of words because your prayer life lasts about five minutes anyway. Doesn't it? Ten? Second Chronicles. Chapter 16, looking down in verse number 9. This is Asa... <laughs> He's a great king in the beginning, and he winds up messing up at the end. But Asa says this in verse number 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Could you just please underline that? I see some of you doing that. That's a blessing. Can I ask you this question if we're looking at that? Who is the heart, I mean, who is the, uh, the Lord showing himself strong to? 
Look at it. It's simple English. Who is the Lord? Brother Berkey, your Bible student. Milk out the passage. Who is the Lord showing Himself strong to on the behalf of who? So let me ask you a question before I read the rest of the verse. Is the Lord showing Himself strong to you? Is it possible, if He's not, that your heart is not perfect toward Him? Perfect there doesn't mean you're doing perfect. It means the relationship between you and Him is on par. It's level. It's where it ought to be. It's you and Him, uh, you agreeing with Him against yourself, and you are in perfect harmony with Him. You want God to show Himself strong in your life? He said, no, no problem. Let's just make sure me and you are right. You got something in your tent? You remember a boy by the name of Achan? You remember when that boy went over there, the Lord said, now you're going into Jericho and the walls are going to come down. You're going to walk seven times and then on the seventh day you're going seven times. You're going to let out a good shout, man, and the walls are going to fall in. And when you go in, you're going to take over everything in that town. Only rule I want you to know and understand is, is that now the victory is mine and I'm going to give you the victory. And, but when you go in there, you don't touch anything. It's all mine. Tell me who knew Achan had the gold, the Babylonian garment, and the silver. Who knew it? Only God. You ever look at the collateral damage? You ever look how it gradually continued to get worse and worse and worse? Have you ever thought, I do, I read the Bible, read that story, I don't know how many times. I'll tell you how many times I've read the Bible. I couldn't even tell you how many times I've read the Bible. At least twice, I guess, read through the Bible. But a couple times I've read through, I read that story there. And I'm thinking, I wonder if Asa, when that thing, when they lost the battle over there, I wonder if he'd have come back and said, Joshua, I got a problem, it's me. I'm the one, I stole some stuff I shouldn't have stole, and I've messed up. Here it is, here's the wedge of gold, here's the silver, here's the Babylonian garment. I'll take whatever's coming to me. For the Lord's sake, man, this whole thing is my fault. Can you do something for me? I wonder if the story would have been different. I wonder if it had cost him his whole family. I wonder if it had cost the nation of Israel. I wonder if they'd have lost all the stuff they did as far as time and reputation is concerned. But you know what he kept doing? He kept covering it up and covering it up and covering it up and covering it up. And if you read that story, man, you're thinking, man, am I ever going to get to the end of this thing? They go through every stinking tribe. And then when they finally go to and come to the last tribe, they're thinking, man, I can't. And he goes through every single family. And his last name must have been Zippaboo or something like that because he's at the very end before anybody. They go through everybody in there. There's only one family left. He's had all that time to get right. And then all of a sudden he's like, uh, well, <laughs> it's me. Go get his family. Do you ever read it and think to yourself, knowing how good God is and how merciful he is, that if that boy had said right off of Jump Street, I've sinned, I'm wrong. Do you think that the story might have read different? I believe it would have. I don't believe the Lord would have wiped his name out from underneath heaven and caused all that damage collaterally and so on and so forth. And before you get all upset about the kids and stuff like that, they wound up in heaven or in those days down in paradise or Abraham's bosom and all that. You don't have to worry about that. God didn't punish him and put him in hell. That boy's though in question. You say, why? He got his stuff and God's stuff mixed up. Let me ask you a question. God give you something more valuable than gold, silver, and, and uh, gold and a piece of silver and a Babylonian garment? I believe what He did was, is He entrusted you with, uh, He gave you salvation, didn't He? Did He give you forgiveness? Did He give you a place to confess your sins? Why are you withholding something God gave you that belongs to Him? Why don't you let Him forgive you? You got it buried in your tent? How are you doing with your bitterness? God said, let me have it. That root of bitterness will spring up and defile many. Give it to me. Come, he says, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as wool. They'll be red like crimson. They shall be as snow. Let's well, sit down. Let's talk about it. Why won't you sit down? You don't trust Him with your heart? Why not? You did for salvation. Amen. You sure you don't have something that Belongs to God. How are you doing with that forgiveness? 
I'm just asking you. God knows everything, doesn't He? Well, preacher, I know, but you know, that's it's, it's just not the world in which we live. Okay. You know what God's saying? You know what? If you were in 2024, everything I wrote up to now, it doesn't really apply to you. We're in the age of new millennium and new generation X and Z and Y and Q and LPRU and whatever it may be. Yeah, don't, don't worry about that stuff. That's all old fashioned, old timey stuff like that. You know, we got to modernize things a little bit. Don't, don't worry about that. Do you think so? Can I say this to you? If I can do it as muster as much love as possible before I give you the last part of this verse right here. Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Some of you are miserable and you're miserable because you won't do what you know God wants you to do. And you ain't going to do it. You want God to change the other person. And God is not testing the other person. He's testing you. God gave you an opportunity for Him to let you do what you're supposed to do, whether the other person does it or not. God, I don't, I don't care about that. What about you? Watch. End of the verse there. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have... That's a pretty stinking negative message. <laughs> You didn't do what I said for you to do. You're going to have wars from now on. You ever wonder why you have so much conflict in your life? Just suggesting according to the Bible, your heart's not perfect toward the Lord. The problem's you and Him, not you and them. And shall we continue? Acts chapter 17. I'm either making sense and you're quiet about it or you're thinking to yourself, I ain't never heard nobody ever say that before. How dare you think I'm the problem? The problem's the Catholics. The problem's the charismatic. You know, preacher, we need Brother Brad to teach us another lesson on cults. We'll get the stinking tape. You want to learn about cults? You want to learn about the Catholics and the Charismatics and the Church of Christ and the, Mor uh, the Mormons and you want to learn about all that stuff? Go ahead, good. It won't help you at all with what I'm teaching you right now. It won't do anything for you except I'll have to tell Brother Wood or put an extension on the double doors because their heads are so big they can't get through it. I'm for that stuff. But how about the practical stuff? Who would have ever thought that maybe the reason there's no joy in my life and the reason the Lord's not showing Himself strong in my situation, who would have ever thought it might be because I got a heart problem? Who'd have even thought of that? Can't be me. Well, you're blinded by your own ego. It can be any of us. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is that right? But you know what he tells me? He tells me if I get the mind of Christ, I can fix that desperately wicked heart. I can get a heart change, a heart transplant. But i got to be willing to do what he says to do. But it's not easy. But God doesn't want you miserable. This, this always this strife and this struggle with this, oh, the Christian life, it's such a hard thing. It's so difficult. There's always so... Life is difficult. People that aren't saved are having the same problems you are with nobody to help them go through it, folks. People are bankrupt and they're going through death. I mean, listen, there are people in funeral homes tonight having wakes and laying outs and getting ready to park people in the dirt tomorrow. There's people that have a problem. There ain't 10 cents in their bank account. There's people that have kids that are on drugs and drinking and that are pregnant out of wedlock. Every problem that you have, they have, you're not, you're not different just because you're saved. Everybody has trouble. God doesn't walk you walk on. I, I don't know why. It's the Christian life. What do you mean it's not the Christian life? It's life. Amen. Everybody has trouble. Stop blaming God for your trouble. Amen. You live in a wicked world, and if the Bible's right, we're circling the drain right now. For the Lord's sake, why do you think you have who you have in the White House the last 10 presidents? Right. 
The Lord gave us exactly what the... Not you. Not you. You didn't deserve it. No, you were, you were perfect. You were on the right side of things. But everybody else, the Lord said, I'll, put, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you the Bill Clintons of the world and, the, and whoever, whoever. Put in whoever you want. Wasn't any better four years ago than it is now. And four before that, and four before that, and four before that. The, the, the thought of that, that a Christian even thinks of that kind of stuff. Why are you even in the United States of America? Why aren't you in the Dominican Republic? Or Saudi Arabia? How'd you even get here to get saved? I mean, if you had been born in another country, you could have been raised Roman Catholic. That boy, that young man, excuse me, that young man that was here today, driving from Brunswick, coming from a family that's all Church of Christ, and driving down here looking for a church, that's an anomaly. That's like, you got to be kidding me, man. Well, why? Well, I got a church five miles down the road or ten minutes down the road, but I, I, can't, I can't go to that church. How are you even here? The very idea that all I have is going on is because God... You know what the Lord's saying to you? Really? I, I'm your problem? Well, wh well, why did you even come to me to get saved then? He's not interested as much as you may think in the here and now. He's interested in the hereafter. And the quicker you get your eyes on that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not chastising you. I just want you to understand, of all people that should be joyous in this, we should not be having problems with things going on in the world. You know what we should be doing? Praise the Lord, I'm going to heaven, man. Praise the Lord. You know what the preacher's going to do? He's going to have a revival on Friday night. He's going to preach Wednesday night. And then the brother Ronovan is going to come in and preach three days to us. Praise the Lord. At least that'll be four days. I might not mess up too bad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That ought to be good. Man, we're going to have some singing. We're going to have some preaching. We're going to have some praying. Woo! Man, what a blessing. What's going on at work tomorrow? Who cares, man? I got church coming. Amen. Some of you, I think, honest, I really do. I think if the Lord didn't change your mind, I think you'd be miserable in heaven. You enjoy being miserable. It's, it's, like, it's like you're so... No, that's not even a good word. You're so full of yourself that you're just not happy and you just, you're not happy unless you make everybody else unhappy. You're like... You have pig pen syndrome. Everywhere you go, there's like this cloud over you. It's Eeyore. Man, it's a beautiful day today. Raining when it got up, 4 o'clock. Pouring. Cats and dogs, man. Can't even believe it. Just put out my new maters, washed them all out. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Beautiful day today. A little chilly for me. I mean, you know, I got to get in the car. I'm kind of cold. Then I walk in here, it's like walking into an igloo cooler. <laughs> Y'all got Eskimo Parkers around here? It's so cold in here, you can hang meat. I'm, 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 I'm honestly, I'm thinking, beast of fire out of a living room. And somebody deciding their little kid can learn how to use the bathroom for the first time on my wall. I'm just being honest. I'm glad for this place. You say, what? Tile walls. I, I like the air conditioner. I know an air conditioner used. You remember the one that we had, the squirrel in it? Had to have been a squirrel. Because no matter what we did, how much belt dressing we put on it or whatever, right when I get started, I think maybe y'all might have done it, but right when I get started preaching that thing and start going, <laughs> and y'all tried to fix it, but then Lord help us. You remember that building was packed out in there like sardine can? And you remember that you'd turn off the air conditioner because it would be squeaking so loud, and in five minutes, you thought you were sitting in a sauna having some kind of hot yoga or something. <laughs> I mean, the Lord's been good to us. Amen. You know, okay, carpet gets dirty every now and then. Call a carpet cleaner. I'm glad we got carpet. Amen. We didn't used to have it. We had that old green stuff. They'd been down there a million years. You couldn't even find something to replace a square of it. They didn't even make that stuff anymore. It was probably made out of asbestos or something. <laughs> probably kill you. We used to lay on that rug. 
I mean, I, God knows what was in there. I know Seventh-day Adventists walked all over it. We used to lay on that rug and pray. Yes, we did. Lay on the rug. Ladies, you remember we'd go in the little bitty room over there and you ladies would gather around the altar, them big old bull ants would crawl all over you and the roaches crawling on you and you'd shout and you'd think somebody had the Holy Ghost and all that kind of a deal. And you'd come out there, spray the whole thing with a raid and then put your mask on and go right back to praying. Yes, you did. And you were glad about it. And we gather in that little old block building in there with that little tiny one horse air conditioner in there and we'd all gather in a circle in there. I mean, you talk about cheek to cheek, man. I mean, we were cheek to cheek in there. And we get in there and start praying, boy, and the Lord come down on that place, you'd think the sides of the building were going to explode. And now you walk in here. Yeah, it's like an igloo in here. Well, bring a blanket. Thank God you got a place to come. You know, when I went in the bathroom the other day, some kind of floaty in there. <laughs> hey, beats the fire out of portalettes. Yeah. The men in there used to have to go to the portalettes. Man, there is nothing that smells better than a portalette in a hundred degree summer heat. There ain't no way to make it smell good. They put all kind of foo-foo juice in there. They put purple stuff in there. They put pine salt in there. I don't care, man. Unless you jammed ammonia capsules up your nose and you walk in that thing, it was a hurry up, get on, and get out. Amen. And you ladies, you know what you'd do? Y'all were so prim and proper. You'd stand under the eve of that old concrete building over there. You'd stand back up next to that thing. It'd be pouring rain. And you'd be waiting your turn to be next in the bathroom. We only had two of them. We had two holer. And that's it. You remember that? And you'd go and you never would complain. You thought you had died and gone to heaven because you actually had flushing toilets. If you got baptized over there, man, I mean, you'd come out of that thing shivering and shaking like a polar bear that just took an ice dip. We did our best to try to warm up that water with these stinking fish heaters and it didn't do anything. It wouldn't have kept a goldfish warm, man. And you jump down on that thing and I know it was cold because I could feel it coming through the waders and I'm thinking, you'd be standing there. God help you, if I got on a string, it's kind of like, can you just dunk me and can I get out of here, please? Can I get out and then get back in and that kind of thing. And now you got, it feels like a jacuzzi. You're fixing to move over there. God's brought us a long way. But you're still talking about the leeks and garlics in Egypt. How much better it was under Pharaoh's whip. God hadn't done anything for you since you came out of Egypt? Amen. All things are naked and open. I think the Father looks down there and says, man, that's some of the most ungrateful people I've ever seen in my life. I guess just saving their soul ain't quite enough. Listen at the way they talk about each other. Y'all had Christmas time here just recently, didn't you? Oh, I'm out of time. Give me a minute. Acts chapter... 17. We probably had people at the table that hadn't seen each other. And instead of just being glad that you're getting a chance to see them, some of the family dinners, they kind of erupted into a family squabble, didn't they? After you've taken all that time to make the prime rib or the roast beef or the crab dip or whatever it is you decided to make and have a big dinner and in your mind, boy, we're going to sit down and just have a wonderful time of fellowship. And the next thing you know, it's like, well, because all it takes is just one. It changes the entire atmosphere. I'm talking about judging yourself as a son. Do you think that a son should be harder on himself than an unsaved sinner? I believe there's a responsibility in being a son. Acts chapter 17, let me just give you two more and we'll close. 
Look at verse number 31. Thirty And at the times ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, in that He hath raised Him from the dead. I'm in Acts chapter 17. You know what He just said? He said there's a day coming where they're going to have to answer for it. Come to Romans 2 and we'll close for the night. I listened to a preacher one time. He preached a message and I, if I could find it, I would take the outline and rework it and I'd preach it. But the basic gist of that entire message Was, would you want to die in the condition that you're in right now and be judged by your worst enemy? You know how we are, especially in the South. Bad to talk ill about the dead. But what this preacher was saying is, is that it ain't the people that know you, that love you, that overlook you that are where the issue is. Where the issue is, is the people that know you and they judge you based on how you've treated them. Because the other ones are already saved. Would you like to die knowing that your greatest enemy would like to stand up at the great white throne when they're about to be cast into hell and say, Excuse me, I don't have nothing to lose. See that guy right up there with a white robe on that looks like Jesus Christ in the image of Christ? See that guy right there? Yeah, his name's Peacock. You see him right there? Now, I realize he's a saint and trusted you because he's here because he trusted you. But I'd like to testify of how that guy treated me. And I'm not saying I'm going to hell because of him. I'm saying I'm going to hell because I didn't trust you. I get that. But I'd like to testify against him and my dying word before I get cast in the lake of fire. I'd like to have a say. I'd like to have a go at him. Well, preacher, you know, you know, friends and friends come and go, but one enemy will last you for a lifetime. I know you can't always have all friends, but the ones I'm talking about are the ones you could fix and don't. And the ones that instead of you asking the Lord to help you get right and help you to love your enemies and bless them that persecute you, that you can't enjoy life until they get right. Well, let me just tell you something straight up as I can possibly be and serious as a sack full of rattlesnakes. As soon as God fixes that one, there'll be another one to take their place. Because the problem is not the people in your life. Amen. The problem is you. And you don't smoke, and you don't drink, and you don't go to the wrong places. But boy, when it comes to getting along with God's people. Well, preacher, don't well preacher me. You answer for yourself, I'll answer for me. Are you in Romans 2? Look down there around verse uh, about 15. Left hand, right hand page, left hand column there. Make it 14. The Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. They don't know what else to do, so they, they know what to do according to their conscience. Verse 15, which show a work of a law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Their, their what? Their thoughts? they made up their mind who they will and who they want. There's no authority. Ladies and gentlemen, you have an authority. I'm talking about judging yourself. I'll close with this. When it comes time for judgment seat of Christ, 
I'm not like some people teach, and I won't say they're wrong. I can't say for sure. I've never been there. But it doesn't look like that's sort of a generalized judgment, and he judges us corporately. And the way I got a picture of that thing is, is you might be up there in front of the Lord, and everybody might be an onlooker or a watcher or whatever you want to call that. They may be a spectator, but they won't have taken part of uh, your judgment. That's going to be strictly between you and the Lord. The Lord's the one that gives out and divvies out the judgment, and He's not really interested in man's opinion or He doesn't need a witness. And the reason He doesn't need a witness is because He's God and He's been watching everything you do. He's got a Blu-ray, DVD, MP3, uh, whatever you want to call it, of everything you've ever done, and you don't want Him to pull it out. When you get up there to the judgment seat of Christ, it isn't going to matter what everybody else did and how everybody else handled it. God's going to call me and you into account on an individual basis. And He's not going to say, what did Miss Barbara do? What did Brother Larry do? What did Brother Sam do? What did Brother Brad do? What did Brother Lance do? What did Brother Woodard do? What did Brother Roger do? You know what He's going to say? What did you do? The trouble you're in is not because maybe you did something wrong. It's God seeing how you'll handle what comes your way. It's not always about trying your faith to see if you can get through it and God can spank you or wear you out or whatever. It's if God sees fit to allow you to go through trouble, the test is how you handle the trouble that God saw fit to allow to happen. That's Christianity. And I'll say this, with whoever your enemies are, I, I literally, I, I wouldn't, I, look, we just got a letter a couple of days ago. This idea of forgiving people without holding them accountable for things, especially wicked and ungodly things, that's not biblical forgiveness. And some things you have to let go and let God handle those things. Those aren't the things I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. It's the thing that if you boil them down to the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord were to ask you one-on-one, -on -one, you mean to tell me your relationship with me was put on hold because of you fill in the blank? Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, you mean, you mean all of that. You mean to tell me this and we're done. How you felt toward them meant more to you than how I feel toward you. Because you let them control you more than you let me to control you. Some of us might be guilty of idol worship. Because we worship that idol of bitterness. Preacher, that's a little... Serious. Why do you think it's going to be at the judgment seat? You don't think something might crop up at the judgment seat that causes terror to strike through your bones? And you're thinking, oh man, I didn't see that one coming. Father.